Uh, good afternoon, and welcome to the American University Museum at the Katz and Art Center. You're in the Alpha Initiative for Washington Art. Since we opened the American University Museum in 2005, it's been our mission to reveal and preserve our culture, communicate what is most relevant and necessary from our past, and stimulate positive and meaningful change. It's no wonder then that the museum has consistently exhibited and supported the work of Gail Riva. Since 2009, when she began to create her photo collages, examining the culture history, cultural history of Washington, D.C. and the region. Her photo collages offer an unsentimental look at our cultural history and the transformations occurring throughout the United States. Most importantly, her recent work has been bringing to light the resistance of our River Road African communities to gentrification, racism, and desecration. Gail has become a highly effective voice for bringing about real change. In fact, uh, recently the uh, Montgomery County School Board changed the curriculum of the middle schools, largely a result, result of the shows that uh, Gail has been such a major part of. There will be four panel discussions uh, d addressing the issues raised by the retrospective of Gail's work that you see around you. This afternoon's discussion is titled The Deeply Social Art of Gail Rebun. Allow me to introduce the participants. Gail Rebun <laughs> is a Washington, D.C. based photographer and professor emerita of photography at Northern Virginia Community College. She has an MFA from California Institute of the Arts and an undergraduate degree from Antioch College. Gail has exhibited internationally and nationally, and her work is included in the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. That's where Yale is. And the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities. Sally Stein is the curator of the exhibition. She's Professor Emerita, Department of Art History, UC Irving, and Irvine, and is an independent scholar based in Los Angeles who researches and writes about the 20th century photography and its relation to broader questions of culture and society. She's written about New Deal FSA photographers, particularly Dorothea Lange, Marianne Post Wolcott, Jack Delano, and as well as the contested image of FDR. She has also written numerous essays about popular mass media, Ladies Home Journal, Life, and Look, along with continuing her study of the various aspects of the lives of color photography. The interrelated topics Sally most often engages concern the multiple effects of documentary imagery, the politics of gender, and the status and meaning of black and white and color imagery on our perceptions, beliefs, even actions as consumers and citizens. We're also joined by Stephen Nelson. He's the Dean of the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts at the National Gallery of Art, Washington, D.C. Nelson has published widely on the arts, architecture, and urbanism of Africa and its diasporas and on queer studies. Among his many publications is the seminal book on African architecture in its native land and abroad, from Cameroon to Paris, Muscum, Muscum Architecture in and Out of Africa. Stephen's writings on the contemporary and historic arts, architecture, and urbanism of Africa uh, and its diasporas African American art history and queer studies have appeared in numerous anthologies, journals, and exhibition catalogs. He was a leading co-author of the recent collection Visualizing Empire, Africa, Europe, and the Politics of Representation, Issues and Debates, and is completing a much-awaited study of the myths and the representations of the Underground Railroad. He's the Professor Emeritus at the University of California, Los Angeles, and a member of the Crest Foundation 
Board of Trustees, and has been named a member of the Society of Architectural Historians 2021 class of fellows. He earned his BA in studio art from Yale University and an uh, MA and or AAM and PhD in art history from Harvard University. We hope this will be a conversation, not only between the panelists, but towards the end, uh, we hope the audience will also join in the conversation. Uh, allow me to turn the microphone now over to curator Sally Stein, and thank you, Pamela, for being here. I'm really excited to hear this. Can you hear me? Yes? Okay. Um, and if you hear me coughing, I have a little asthma. It's not COVID, I promise. Um, so um, I, I guess I, when I heard this about FDR, I thought some of you might be confused as to what does that mean, the contested image. And it really has to do with um, the sort of unspeakable disability of, sorry, the unspeakable disability from polio of FDR, that we had a president during, in some ways, our most challenged period of the United States of the Great Depression, who himself could not stand on his own. And while he spoke indirectly about this, uh, it, was, it was something that was generally not spoken about, that he didn't want spoken about, because leaders should stand before yeah. us. And um, so I sort of delved into this in some ways unspeakable and largely hidden question. This is before there was finally an added sculpture to the FDR memorial that had FDR in a wheelchair. Um, so, uh, and, and the reason I bring this up right now is that um, I suddenly realized looking over there towards Gail's work about her father who was an amazing self-made man as a refugee who became an international labor leader um, that she deals with the unspeakable, <coughs> unspeakable decline of her father in his last years um, and decides we need to talk about this. Um, we need to speak about it and we need to show it. And need not only to show his decline and suffering, but also the work involved in helping, uh, being a caregiver in this period. So and if being a caregiver is not something I dealt with sufficiently, I now think, uh, in terms of FDR. But I think it's very important, this dual sort of trajectory in this work over here about her father. And it relates also to the mix of issues and emotions in terms of dealing with her family as a first generation American. I'm not gonna talk very much today, or I'm gonna try not to, um, but because I talk a lot on the wall, and if you want more talk, uh, I would refer you to the catalog, which has about nine comment, um, essays uh, commenting about bodies of work. <coughs> but I wanted to say something about how we first met, which was back in, we think, 83. We're still not sure it's so long ago, like 100 years, um, when I was invited to teach a short one or two week workshop on uh, the cultural history of color photography, something I was studying at the time. Uh, kind of crazy to like go, okay, I'll teach, uh, you know, earn while you learn. Um, and Gail was one of less than a dozen people who signed up for this course uh, in the summer in Rochester, New York at the Visual Studies Workshop. And all of the students, I think all of the students, were themselves photographers exploring color in their work who signed up for this class. And um, mm -hmm. they all brought portfolios they wanted me to look at. Uh, which was not really part of the coursework, but it was not surprising this would happen at VSW. But when Gail showed me her work, I was astounded. I had never seen early work such as we see over this wall, um, in, especially in color. But really, I'd never seen sequential work that really explored both um, the segmenting of time and what happens if you look closely at each of those stills in a series about family relations. Um, I really started laughing when I started reading her captions, which were very well composed, and there's Lil serves a Mark another cup of coffee. It is really about how gender relations get reproduced um, from parents then down to children, etc. And she, my kind of feminism was probably to scream too much, and she in fact, <laughs> 
does not scream. She speaks slowly and quietly, but very to the point about these gender relations, these power relations as well. It was also true in the next series, which is about sequential still lifes, where we never see people, and yet in looking simply at four scenes of the exact same setup, the same place, very ordinary scenes, in color, it's always like snapshots. Uh, one had to start asking, okay, who's making a mess of the towels lined up, and how did they get, in fact, re-lined up and cleaned, laundered? So we're constantly asking questions about the questions that hardly ever get answered, ask you or answered, about who's doing the, the, the bulk, the lion's share of work, and who's minding the baby. And then in this work over here, she really deals with who's minding the baby, as well as how much she learns in the process of learning from her children and their various influences of their watching their parents, but also they're picking up lots from television. I really love the scene we have open here of uh, her younger son, who she says she was concerned he was never going to learn proper pronouns because everything was he and his and nothing was her uh, and she. And suddenly, because uh, the father uh, liked watching sports, the kids are watching sports TV and they're female wrestlers. And, and so here's where you can learn sometimes from TV unexpectedly. And the, the younger son calls out, they're her wrestlers. And thus, the pronoun problem has been breached uh, in the, or, yeah, broached in this way. So, um, and it seems to me that this interest in looking very closely at details, both in the archive and out the world, um, continues when she starts looking at her larger neighborhood, and uh, both in Tenley Town and then more broadly in DC. But the, the micro and the domestic and the familial continues in this work about her father uh, and. Um, in this work at the very, at most recently, both about BACC, the Moses Cemetery, how she's excavating, literally documenting the excavation of desecrated cemetery grounds and what might be moved there. <coughs> and also beginning during COVID to document her older self. We've seen a couple of pictures of herself earlier, but now as she's coming close to 70, she decides Yes, this is the time to show another, un what is often kept off scene, it's always considered obscene, and that is how our body, all our bodies age if we're so lucky to experience even that passage of time. So that's enough for me, but uh, any questions? I will come at the end. Next is good. So uh, my work deals with time and change, and I'm very, everything changes, and photography is just a wonderful medium for documenting change. Uh, and I love the way photographs become historical documents very, very quickly. Uh, but I also really like to talk about the things that you're not supposed to talk about, uh, which is what I do throughout the work. So with the family, the early work, the family sequences, it's very much about mundane, everyday life, and to me that's what most of life is, um, and the repetitiveness, and as Sally said, the gender and generational roles that we fall into, even if we consider ourselves feminist or that we're doing something different, we tend to fall into those roles. Um, and the unpaid labor of mothering and of caregiving uh, to talk about that, and um, with my father's decline, I think people don't really like to talk about the end of life issues and the type of decline that happens, but if you're fortunate, you will uh, deal with that. I think most people do deal with that, and I think if it was talked about a lot more, uh, it wouldn't be so shocking, and people would be a little bit more prepared to, to deal with those issues. And the same thing with my own aging body, um, yeah, I'm emphasizing all the things that are photoshopped out of photographs or people have plastic surgery to eliminate. Um, and I'm t trying to, in some degree, rejoice on those and to talk about those, and that those are natural and it's living. It's that we're still here and that's a good thing to be able to experience that. But the words underneath are absolutely essential 
to the piece, which are all the synonyms for older women. Um, and almost all of them are pejorative, like Adelbacks, Crone, uh, Kruger, Matron. Um, they're almost all pejorative words. And you know, why is that? What does that, that say about our culture? Um, and likewise, the cultural history work is about change. There's always been something that was there before. If you've lived any place for a while, you see that it's changed. Um, but I often, and I think it's probably true nationwide, but I've mainly done it in the DC metro area, there's almost always a racial aspect when you, when you really delve into the history and some kind of displacement that has happened um, racially or ethnically. Um, so I have lots of work. Uh, obviously, we had to be very selective about what, what is in um, the exhibition, but people don't like to talk about it. They don't like to acknowledge it. Um, there was just an article in the paper about Ward 3 by Courtney Malloy um, talking about that, that, that this area, it's, it's not an accident that it's become an affluent white neighborhood. So to really talk about that. But also there's a lot of humor in the work. So, I, and the humor is very important uh, to me as well. I want to get I wanted to get an outside voice. Uh, and so I invited Steve, whom I knew back in uh, LA when he was a distinguished professor at UCLA and is now in Washington. And he kindly agreed. And I thought he could serve as the interlocutor who would ask the first questions to Gail. Maybe also to me, I have no idea. We'll see what he asks. All right. Um, first of all, I want to thank um, Sally and Gail. Uh, for asking me to join them. It, it, it's great, and it's been really great reading the catalogs and, and, and looking at the work. And and at first, I mean, when, when one walks in, and you know, I saw a number of you milling around and looking at the work, it it feels disparate, right? And so on the one hand, you have these, these sort of analyses of space and relationships, right? You're, with your family over here, then suddenly we're moving into sort of gentrification and you know, what's going on there, and then the series with your father, and then your own body. And, and where they all seem to come together to me, for me, and I would love to hear both of you talk about this, is A, in time. Like, and, and not just, oh, I'm illustrating time. But you're, you're actually exploring how time works, and it's unexpected, because we think of, you know, we're, we're sort of trying to think of you know, the onward march of time, like it is linear. And you're, you're just going from A to a B that you will never actually arrive at, right? Until you die. And, um, but, but you do collage. And collage messes with time. It messes with time. So you've got these things where, where you're superimposing narratives onto the works. Or in the case of your, your dad, which I think is so amazing, You've superimposed four years under four pictures. And it, you know, we're constantly doing it back and forth. You know, time, time of his life, time 2002, three, four, five, time, you know, oh, there was this thing that happened on, you know, X date, and you know, many of you, if you, you know, care for parents. But, oh, I remember when I had to do that. I remember when my mother went to hospice. I remember, you know, and all of this. So there's this sort of, your time, his time, my time. And I would love to hear you talk about how that all sort of works with these different these, 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 these. And Sally, what you're attracted to, too, when you bring it together. I mean, in terms of the, the, the cultural history stuff, the reason why I wanted to superimpose it is to give you a sense of, um, and so there are different layers of opacity, that it all exists simultaneously that we, the past is never gone, and it, it totally influences the neighborhoods, it totally influences what is going on, and the same thing with the uh, family history work, that, that it's, it's superimposed because what happened in the past is affecting the present, and it's really all, all at the same. And, and, and the thing that you said about linear, one of the things I really liked about that piece is that the decline isn't linear either. Um, so that in the, in the first one, he looks healthy, and he looks sort of healthy in the third one. 
uh, much better than in the second one. So it, it's, a, it's an up and down kind of thing. I really wanted to convey this. Oh, it's working. All right. it's, that's even true at different times of the day, right? If you're hair for someone who's right. experiencing dementia or, or whatnot, suddenly at noon they're good, and then they start to sun down. Right. And almost, then you see it almost every day. Right. Right. But yeah. Yep. Can you not hear me? It's got to be close. All right. Here we go. Um, but 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 that. I mean, I think that is. So interesting, but but what also happens? Can you can you talk about? You, there's a, a beautiful analog of your your mother going to Poland, right? And and the you know, the, the the markers have been you know, sort of repurposed for walls of pools and things like that. So there are these stories and and land stories that get covered, land that is desecrated, right? And that's a really amazing analogy to to what you're seeing on River Road, and I would love for you to talk about that the, that analogy and how it, you know and your yeah no it feels experience. totally personal the experience of the uh, African it was African and African American because it's from before uh, Africans were considered citizens so it's African and African American. But it feels totally personal to me. Um, the desecration of the cemetery that was paved over in the 1960s, uh, and the whole neighborhood was um, destroyed. That was a very thriving uh, black neighborhood on River Road that had existed from before the Civil War. Uh, but it feels very personal to me. It feels exactly similar to what happened with my mother's family. I mean, there are hardly any Jews left. Uh, my mother did go back to the town she grew up in. There was like one Jew left, where it would have been maybe 40% Jewish or something in that town. Um, and the cemetery, when she got there, the Jewish cemetery that had been there, um, the, the tombstones had been used for swimming pools, to line swimming pools. Um, and then now it's just a wall all around the cemetery. Because they have no idea where the, where, they, where the different people are buried. And I think it's completely analogous. So it does feel it does feel very personal. I think that a lot of the experience of being the other and not being considered quite human, it's 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 all very similar. Well, there's a difference. And that is I think that there are many um, Jewish Americans and Jewish American artists and photographers who then mainly focus on the Holocaust and also returning both to both the camps and former homes of their relatives, their ancestors. And in some ways, that's a backstory for Gail. And what she instead decided to do uh, in the last five, seven years is to join up to deal not with sort of Jewish history, not that she's denying the Jewish history, but we have, we have a, a similar situation here, just over the line in Maryland. And I need to join this largely African-American coalition to work on saving, protecting what remains of the cemetery, um, and also supporting their plan to develop a museum based on this forgotten history. Gail and I have had actually slightly differences um, many times uh, over this last 14, 15 months. She goes, the past is always here. And I go, the past is so often papered over. And it seems to me that her reclamation work behind us is to remind us of what has largely been papered over. And we too often forget. And with cheap architectural renovation nowadays, it's so much easier even to paper things over so that it looks brand new and there's nothing underneath. And yet, of course, as we learn at the National Archives in engraved over incised over the doorway. The past is prologue, but too often we don't want to remember the past. We suffer from uh, cultural amnesia, and uh, her work is really trying to um, counter that. But I think even if we don't remember the past, <coughs> we're living the past, and we're, and we're affected by the past. And I do think one difference is that um, with working with the people at the Bethesda African Cemetery Coalition is that like Jews can kind of camouflage themselves. I mean, I can pass and pe 
people might not immediately discriminate against me or whatever, which is impossible if you have a dark skin. That just doesn't happen, and that's such a significant difference. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, um, but but it, but what you know? But if looking at the, the, the work, the work behind us, the work over there, um, when you were making that, because what you're doing is layering and layering, and layering, and and you know you're you're looking in some cases at pres you know, the present day, so the picture is the present day, and then suddenly you have what I would call data. Mm -hmm. Right, um, you know numbers. You have the population statistics. You've in one piece. You've got other kinds of, of bits and pieces, newspaper stories, and the like. So it's it's the archive, but it's also data, right? Which purports to be objective, which purports to you know sort of really sort of shed light on things in 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 quantitative ways, right? And and so how did when you were deciding to do those kinds of like include those kinds of things. What was going through your brain? Well, what, what you know? Yeah, they're very laborious uh, doing these cultural history pieces yeah. because I, I spend a lot of time in the archives. I mean, I'm not trained as as a historian at all, um, but I do spend a lot of time researching it, and I probably over research it. And then obviously, it's a very selective process about what what I include. So I mean, sometimes I include things because they're humorous. Um, but um, yeah. seal test, I right, right. I remember, right, right. But um, oh, uh, in the terms of the newspaper articles and things, it's it's you know, and of course we know newspaper articles are not completely accurate, but I treat them as such. Is is things that I think are really important for people to know. So that's how I include them. I mean, sometimes it's yeah. visual also yeah. uh, if it works visually. I guess I wanted to add one other thing, provoked by what Stephen asked about time and the formal questions. From the very beginning, I liked the way, first of all, it was small, it, it was in color, and in some ways, it, it was a time when still we thought of color not significant in photography. Uh, it's not significant photography. Ansel Adams is significant photography. And there's this, there was a reigning idea that continues in some ways to this day, of whether in black or white or color, it should be composed as the perfect moment. And Gail's work from the very beginning suggested there is no perfect moment. It's all in flux. And one could say, and it has been argued, well then, don't work with photography, which stills everything. Uh, go to film, but film has another way of, we have, it all slides by us as we watch. And, it's harder to focus on a single moment. So Gail actually looked early for, well, how can I work at getting people to think about both the moments and the intervals and no one moment being so prized? And, um, and I think that's really almost anti-photographic as she then turns to collage, which is often considered, I think even Jack said, well, maybe this isn't really photography. It is something else. Um, and that it's something more hybrid, but it is the hybridity of life that really interests scale in both its micro and macro aspects. And I first started out, ironically, doing video. I mean, my first experience was video, so I feel like I'm one of the very few people that goes from video to still photography, because pe usually people go the other way around, although I have done some videos as well. Um, but I, I am, am very attached to the single image. I mean, to the, not to the single image, but to the still image, and how you can examine it in a way that you can't examine uh, video. But I do feel the need to show the before and after everything's done perfect. Should we all have lunch? Yeah. yeah, if people have questions, please, you know, raise your hands and we will get to you. And if you don't have questions, I'm happy to keep talking. So. You may not want that. <laughs> I just, last night at the opening, it was very soft. Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious in terms of, of this whole uh, presentation on your dad's aging. Um, how engaged was he in this process? 
Yeah, that's that's a very good question because in uh, all my family work, I've always shown it to my family before I've exhibited it um, and to get their approval. And I've always felt that photography can be very exploitative, like street photography and that sort of thing, where the people don't don't realize that you're using their image. So I always felt really that doing my family uh, as representatives of larger society, they, there's this accountability. So, but with this work was the first time I did not show him the work while I was doing it. I mean, he saw me doing it, he knew that I did a lot of work, he was familiar with the other work, but he wouldn't have been able to comprehend it at all. Um, so, uh, but, but, you know, but he was aware that I was doing it. Were, were these uh, his words or your thoughts as to what he would have said? No, no, they're what he said. Yeah, yeah, they're what he said. So I know that you prefer uh, not for your work that you're here. That you prefer not posing people. You prefer candid. However, I was reading that there's certain naturally endowed poses that be attributed to different spe different species. I'm wondering in those last two pictures of your father, was he posed or he was just holding his hands like that naturally? Yeah, yeah. I know. I never, I never pose people. Um, I, I never told people what to do. I had a similar train of thought dealing with the photography of your son's room and I think about coming back from college at 19 and would have been horrified if my mother took photos of my underwear drawer. <laughs> How did you navigate that as a family with regard to his like growing autonomy? You related to the subject but also being the artist and did you do it secretly? Well actually so this work I did when he was home from uh, college over the summer and he had a summer job and I photographed his room when he was working. Um, and so I did it all summer while he was working, but I never moved anything at all. It was just the camera angle. But at the end of the summer when I put them all together, I said to him, I've done some work about you this summer, and, and I'd like to show it to you before I show it to anybody else. And his face went totally white. And he was like, really like horrified. But then when I showed him the work, thank goodness, he just burst out laughing. And he just thought it was really, really funny. And he gave me permission to, uh, to exhibit the work. And in fact, when I had a show of this work at Montpelier Art Center, um, he said to me not to invite his, his then girlfriend's mother to the opening. He said, she, she likes me. I don't want her to change her opinion. <laughs> but, but he helped me transport the work to the gallery. So. Um, so he was fine with it. But I, I do have to say, when I was getting the work uh, mounted, uh, and I took it to a service bureau to print, I couldn't print it this big, the guy behind the counter said, I'm sure glad my mother never did that for me. <laughs> did you tell him to clean his room? Well, that's the other thing. There is this ambiguity, because I feel like I'm a bad mother, that I allow his room to look like that, and to, ha to have that. You know, I mean, I should make him clean up. After he went away to college, I cleaned it up. Oh, you? I cleaned it up after he left, yeah. Got rid of the pizza box. Which makes you both a permissive and probing mother. <laughs> probing photographer mother. So she's juggling always right. many roles. But then, but then, you know, with your son, I mean, you were, you've been photographing and doing all this all his life. Exactly. And so this couldn't have been a huge surprise. Right. That's yeah. true. Yeah. And so. In both sons were here last night. Uh, one brought a bouquet, and we both went out to dinner as bros um, last night. Yes. I mean, I'm glad you brought up the history of FDR and his image, and it brings up the question of agency in controlling an image. Um, FDR was very careful never to be photographed in his wheelchair and not to present that image to the world, and obviously activism has moved us forward to the point that we're sort of outing him. And 
there's a sort of superimposition of pejoratives that we do as a culture, but there's also the uh, accumulation of pejorative connotation to the words we use. So in the disability rights movement, you know, words like idiot and moron were originally technical terms that became pejorative. And then there's the reclaiming of terms like queer as an agency idea. So I just, and one other thought attached is who reclaims and how they reclaim can also be hegemonic. So in Israel now, Ir David, you know, the excavation outside the old city of Jerusalem, you have 10 or 15 opportunities as to which level, if any, you dig up and, and center, right? So it's hegemonic to say this is the level of civilization we're going to reclaim. So I just want to raise those thoughts for you to reflect on. When I was studying it, the whole process of the ambiguities in representation, the way clues are sometimes given but never fully offered, uh, and then I, I was still write, working, researching and writing my essay when finally the wheelchair image sculpture was first commissioned and then installed. And it wasn't my favorite idea of how to remedy the non-disclosure uh, in the previous memorial plans by Halpern. Um, there, and I, in my essay, I actually show another image that I felt was more about how he wanted to manage this, in some ways, complexity. And um, in, when he's running for governor of New York State, he posed using two canes. Uh, so I often, actually, his son served as a kind of grace in public presentations. But um, his son was not there. Uh, and um, I thought, this is about the sort of theatrical performance of politics and presentation in politics. And it, it, to me, it made more sense to leave it ambiguous as he had left it. But that wasn't how it came down in terms of the memorial. Well, there were organizations pushing hard for the wheelchair. There were organizations pushing. I, and ultimately, uh, I still have mixed feelings about, I mean, I, I'm certainly not trying to deny the wheelchair, but it seemed to me somewhat ahistorical. And, and this other one was more historical as his own presentation. But it, it, it also points to the fact that so often we don't all get to control our own images as much as we might like to. Um, it also gets to the notion of history as being about us and not about the thing we're writing about. And so, you know, history is, you know, so often always about the person writing it. It's always about the moment in which it's written. Um, we, and it's always carrying the this sort of cultural values that are that 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 are part of our present, right? Not part of our past, which is why we can see. I think FDR is a good example of how we would have written about him in 1946, as opposed to 1966, as opposed to now, uh, and or the histories that Gale's doing. You know, how would we have have thought about these spaces? 25 years ago, or 45 years ago, or 100 years ago. They, they all change, and, um, and so histories, I mean, if you look at sort of any of these examples and the way they're written about over time, those times always reflect upon the present in which they're written. And then people in the present get angry at the past because, oh, you didn't, you know, you didn't think about black people when you wrote about blah, blah, blah in 1930. And like, well, we didn't think about what people in any of these spaces in 1930. And so, so, but our knee jerk is often to blame the blame the messenger, who yeah maybe deserves a little bit of shade, but you know in term, but but we we want them to be of our values and not of the values that were you know um, sort of surrounding them when they were when they were installed. And you just reminded me of something completely random. Um, my husband and I were obsessed with old Perry Mason. Um, episodes and we watch them nonstop. They, they, we get to 1964 and we start back in 1957 and we just have them on which is auto. And there was an episode on the other day and it, yeah, the protagonist is, is a, a young Japanese woman who just gets to Southern California and she's accused of stealing jewelry and, and murder and mayhem and, and whatnot. 
and it is so racist. It is so racist. And, um, and as a kid, I would not have recognized that. As a 25-year-old, I would not have recognized that. And just, so for some reason today, we were like, oh my god, this is horrible. We still watched it, but it was, it was horrible. But at that moment in 19, yeah, I think it was about 1959 when this one was filmed, that would have been considered fairly benign, but you couldn't make that today. And so there's something about you know how we treat things, how things that we might have done in 1970 are no longer acceptable. And then things in 1970 that weren't acceptable suddenly are. And, it's, and so there's this real dance. And I think that your work actually gets to some of that. You know. Yeah, like, like um, in this piece, I think it's really interesting. I love looking at old maps and what they tell us. And this one says Columbia Institute for the Deaf and Dumb. Yeah. And that's yeah, Gallaudet. Um, and, and, and there's just the terminology that's used. There was the Washington Home for Incurables. You know? yeah. We would never use those terms now. They tell us a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm wondering, when you started taking photographs, there was a long discussion of whether or not to shoot in black and white or in color. Um, you obviously, was that a difficult decision for you, or was it a, something that just you knew right away? And also, the fact that you do shoot in color, how do you think that might have influenced the things you decide to photograph and the way you decide to present the images? Well, I obviously started off shooting in black and white. I mean, that was what we learned. And there's a self-portrait that's in black and white. Um, I remember being very excited being able to, to switch to color. And I, I really wanted to, to use color. Partially, it just gives you so much more information. And um, like the family sequence work, I think if it was in black and white, it would have more of a negative feeling to it, like I'm trying to expose something. Um, but I have done, gone back and forth a little bit. I mean, that one piece there is a, a photo, um, a photogram, basically, um, in black and white. And those two big uh, babies are uh, 20 by 24 inch Polaroids. But, uh, um, I continued that series and I did them in black and white in medium format. I started doing them in color, but they just looked too soft and sentimental and I wanted to emphasize more the way a baby can look to a mother with, uh, where they, they look gigantic and monstrous and not formed. And, and, and I, couldn't, I couldn't do that in color, so I did that. You know, I could with the 20 by 24 inch Polaroids, but I had to go to New York to use that with their artist support program. So, um, so I did do that series in black and white. So I, I don't always, as a given, do it in color. It, I think about it. Here's a question on your On uh, your self, self-portraits, uh, it's how, basically how did you do that? That if they, you took them yourself with, with, with some sort of uh, electronic thing and being able to make sure you had the right angle and everything like this, or did you have somebody else, you line up the shots and, and have someone else take them? I don't understand how you can do this yourself without, and keeping the, the natural forms instead of having things twisted in order to get around to actually do it. Um, no, there was nobody else there. It was it's very intimate. I would never have anyone else around while I was doing that. Um, my camera's on a tripod and I have a remote, mm -hmm. um, so, but I don't know exactly what's going to be in the picture and I do take lots of pictures and some of it is kind of random. I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but with one of the joys of digital is I could look at it right away and um, decide if I got it or not. But it took me, I've been working on that since 2019 or so, and it took me years to figure out how to print it. That was just really hard, figuring out how to edit it and make it uh, look the way I want it to look. There's not much cropping in them. I mean, there is a little sometimes cropping, but there's, there's not much cropping in them. I apologize if the answer's on the wall because I haven't had a chance to, to look at this exhibit. But um, I'm curious how you got started with the Moses Cemetery uh, work. You know what, 
inspired you to do that? And also, if it's not too long an answer, your relationship with the activists who are trying to do what save the cemetery, I guess is the way. Well, actually, it's thanks to uh, Jack Rasmussen that I became involved with uh, Moses Cemetery. There was a show um, that was about three historically black communities in Montgomery County. And I had done work in Tenley Town that had a lot of it dealt with the uh, displacement of the vibrant black community of Tenley Town. And uh, Jack commissioned me to, to do a couple of photo collages for that exhibition. And then I, I got to know them and I really wanted to be involved with that group. Uh, Jeff, you have a um, so, again, I was thinking about the work of your father and how you're documenting how he moves through time and how you've documented yourself moving through time up until this moment. When you get to that point where you no longer have the ability to document yourself, how do you want other people to capture your image or your story? Oh, how do I want other people to do it? I do like being in control. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, it, I've often thought about if my kids were ever going to create artwork, I would not be able to say anything to them, you know, um, but uh, fortunately they don't. Actually, well, we worked on this for over a year. At some point, Gail said to me, you haven't asked me why I switched from video and film to still photography. And I went, uh, okay, uh, tell me. And she said, because there's so many people, one doesn't have all the solo control. So this is simply to support what she just <laughs> said, that she decided she didn't want to be part of a large team. And actually, whenever you watch most movies and there's a credit crawl, there's like 40 to 400 people in the credit crawl. And uh, she really wanted to work independently, personally. So while we're on the issue of control, all right, why don't you two talk about your coming together and the, the sort of process of, of, of your beginning to hear? What is that like? <laughs> well, I think it's very hard as an artist to be impartial about your own work. So it's wonderful to have a curator. This show would not nearly be as good without Sally because I love all the work I've done, you know? And, um, and it's, it's hard to know what resonates, what should be included, what, sh what shouldn't. So it's, it's um, and, and I love the way Sally writes about my work. So it's, it's incredibly helpful to have someone else look at it. But, uh, and we batted things back and forth. And um, we're, I'm a little surprised that no one uh, pressed the issue of what is this floor mat doing on the floor at the entrance to the exhibition? And actually, Gail had proposed, uh, I consider this for the book, and it's not in the book. Um, and I think there are two reasons why it's not in the book. The, the first one is easiest because it's formalist. And I said, it's not going to read when it's reduced to like eight inches across. Because <coughs> precisely because she doesn't work like an advertising photographer. The way the very great Barbara Kruger does in terms of a very simple, single, bold slogan. But there's lots of smaller text and it's done with a light hand. I said it's not going to read. But after it's pretty much gone to the publisher, by the way, couldn't stand some of this work about, I mean, he's a younger man, but he went, you can't put Depends in a book. But um, after everything had gone to the publisher, but I was reading more and more about the resurgence of really evil racism, but also some people writing about how um, it's almost always accompanied by a resurgence of anti-Semitism as well. And I had to think about, I, unlike Gail, and not first generation, I, I come from a surprisingly long line of um, German and French American Jews who came in the middle of the 19th century to this country. In fact, my mother's family is considered Jewish pioneers in Texas for whatever that's worth, which is whatever. 
Um, but it, um, but precisely because of that, it's a pretty assimilated family, especially the maternal strain who learned to uh, let's not bring too much attention to ourselves in Texas. And I think that's influenced me to always think, uh, let's not focus on Jewish issues, but on other issues, because those are much more important. But starting to read about, thinking about the resurgence of anti-Semitism as it may be even a bellwether of the resurgence of lots of anti-immigrant and racial, um, sent, uh, really disgusting racial sentiments, I suddenly went, oh God, I didn't include this in the book, and Gail had pushed me to do this, or Yes, she had pushed me, and I'd said, no, it's not going to reproduce, and it may not be just because it's not going to reproduce well. So I said, let's do it in the exhibition, even though it's not in the book. And then, in a back and forth on the um, phone, I said, maybe we should do it as a floor piece. And Gail knew of someone, some agent's company that does floor reproductions on vinyl. So it really almost, I mean, some people last night said, is it actually a doormat? And we said, no, there's no actual bristles there. This is all photographic. But you reproduced so beautifully. I, I still have regrets. Maybe it's not on the back cover of the book. But we had already gone to press. So, um, yeah. I was wondering, can you say something more about the book? To what extent, you know, is the book a catalog of the show? Or to what extent is the book, you know, a separate product? And how can we best obtain it? Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. I can, I can help you with that. <laughs> They're actually for sale on the front desk. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> no extra cost. No, I, I, I just wanted to follow up on that. Um, so the way the show looks and the catalog and everything, uh, usually it's kind of a collaboration between museum and the preparators and, and and so like we would help you figure out this is how you do a photography show right and they had very very definite ideas completely uh, counter to the way an ordinary photography show would be displayed same with the catalog we had a very rigid format we have this size this thickness this is going to be on the spine they Blew right past it, and and I think that's that's really why the show is so strong and so interesting, is that it's just not, it's it's something that they they came together and figure out how to do it in a very very effective way. Thank you. The way, but I think it's so affirming to us that those gifts, both the exhibition and the publication, work. Well, I mean, the publisher prints in Italy, but um, Sally really encouraged me to go to, to uh, supervise the reproductions, and I am so glad I went. I had no idea that it was so important, um, but it, it, I think the reproductions are fantastic inside the book. I think they look really great, and the, the living series would have looked horrible if I had not been there. Um, the first time they uh, did it, they were all like really very, very light looking. And um, they had to redo the Photoshop files and then um, it still didn't look good. And um, the person who's uh, from MacBooks asked the head of the factory, do I have to redo the Photoshop files again or can we just figure this out on the press? And the guy said, no, you have to redo the Photoshop files again. And I'm not sure exactly what she did to make it look good and all, but I think it looks really great and I'm so glad I went, because I would have been horrified at how it looked otherwise. Uh, we were talking a few minutes ago about outing FDR in the wheelchair and uh, talking about Jewish uh, families and uh, Jewish mothers who want to stay in control. So uh, what did you think about the uh, part of the uh, Fablemans, which is true to the life of Steven Spielberg, but the uh, Spielberg character outing his mother, editing the family of uh, films to show her a, a pair. So that is one question of his doing that, which I guess he did. And then including that in the uh, movie that shows the uh, family uh, story. 
I mean, I don't think I'm that controlling with my family. I feel like I, if, I feel like the one thing I'm really controlling about is my artwork, and um, you know, and I, I mean, my older son did go to film school, um, and so who knows what he'll do after I die or when I'm older? I don't know. Okay, that was. Kiel, I just wanted to ask you to talk about your process of doing the collage. Did you have a time where you like? cut out things and glued, or was it always digital, or talk about your process? No, it was all in Photoshop, always in Photoshop. I mean, I would do it real roughly, and, but all, all, all in Photoshop. Which, yes, um, well, the, they are the one, the one that doesn't have a camera image. Those are Photoshop, yeah. Um, but, but Photoshop at that point to combine text, couldn't do it in Photoshop. You had to do it in um, Illustrator and then bring it into Photoshop. So it was it, it was a combination. The one that's uh, called Majority Black that doesn't have a camera image that I think was done in Illustrator mm -hmm. because Photoshop at that time couldn't be so crisp. But it was always done electronically. assume this is okay to talk about Gail. So she came to me and said she knew that my family was also had immigrant history. So she asked about my mother and my father. She did one who both to see. She did one for my mother. And I remember you went on eBay to order stuff. And so the pictures I provided were black and white, but then she had to color it from the eBay pictures of the town. It's a very interesting text. And then I said, my uncle has a really interesting story. And if he does get a little bit to this story of what isn't isn't available. He, as part of his immigration process, it's someone in the family who knew someone who knew someone got Albert Einstein to sign a letter on his behalf. And so he knew about this. And then years later, he heard about the FOIA process, Freedom of Information Act, that you could get your file. So he got a copy of it. And so, and I had, so anyway, I gave it, I said, you got to, you know, think about this one. So she included this whole thing with the letter from Albert Einstein and the story behind it. There was a lot of, there was anti blatant anti-Semitism as part of this issue as well. Why they needed to get Albert Einstein involved. And in the end, she did this wonderful thing, and I gave a small version of my, luckily my uncle was still alive, loved it, put it on display in his home for a few years. So that's what yeah, I, I have done these kind of family histories of people other than my family, but there's just not enough space to include everything in the show. Any other questions? Well, panel, this has been great. Thank you so much. Uh, very generous.